Hi guys and welcome to Learn Extra Live Grade 11s. Welcome and I hope that you are having a fantastic day and as you can see I've got Phil yeah. joining us. How are you Phil? I'm well thanks to you Andy. Good kids. So what are we going over today? We're talking about the atmosphere. We're talking about atmospheric gases today. Oh cool. It's farting cows guys. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's <laughs> what I said. I had to. I had to. You know that's the physicist, the non-physicist coming out at me. Okay Kay? well we're going to talk about that as well. Okay. I'm going to take my seat. You take, you take your seat at the board. Guys um, make sure that you join us on facebook.com forward slash learn extra also chat to us on twitter at learn extra don't forget this community is not just for us but it's also for you so start engaging ask questions because the only silly question is the one um, that you ask after exams and i've also got very strict instructions from phil that um, grade 12s you should be joining into this lesson too so if you have your grade 12 brother or sister sitting in the next room please call them tell them to come and join in on our lesson so now the usual thing, guys, we're giving away an awesome cal Casio, ugh, Casio calculator and labeler. This labeler, we're only giving one label away, and this is to the best post or comment on the page. And um, the same goes with this awesome Casio calculator. So get posting. Even if it's just an inspirational quote, um, we think that's awesome. But, but questions are good, too. And now before I steal too much of um, Phil's limelight, Phil, take it away. Thank you so much, Indy. Okay, well, as I said today, we're talking about atmospheric chemistry. We're talking about the atmosphere, and this doesn't mean the general feeling in the room. We're going to be actually talking about the gases. Now, the reason that I like this so much is because it comes up in grade 12. You guys really need to understand this section. So grade 11s, grade 12s, even if you're not being tested on this section, it's very, very important that you know something about atmospheric chemistry. Uh, one of the major reasons for that is, of course, it keeps you alive. Okay, so I hope that you're still breathing at home. One of the things that you can actually do is sample some of that atmosphere for yourself. So let's take a look at the basic definition of what the atmosphere is. We're going to chop it up into some pieces. We're going to figure out what part does what and why I need the atmosphere and how we're messing up the atmosphere and how we can fix it. There's a lot of aspects to this which are applicable in grade 12 as well. Now, the biggest problem that we find is that grade 12s don't have the general knowledge behind atmospheric chemistry. And even if you're not tested on grade 11, and you should be, uh, it's quite important that you actually know something about the atmosphere as well. And two of the major problems which we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be showing you the difference between the ozone problem and the global warming problem. There are two very separate uh, problems about this chemistry, and uh, people seem to jumble them up, and hopefully today we can sort that out. Okay, so let's get the show on the road. The atmosphere, now this is the name of a place where there is a whole bunch of gas around the Earth. Now you guys might say, I know all about this. The atmosphere is, of course, the gases around the Earth. Now, it's not as simple as that. Uh, I need to start dividing um, up my picture of the Earth into two very specific parts. Now, in the previous weeks, we've been talking about the lithosphere. The lithosphere, remember, was the layer of rock on the Earth's surface where we find all those valu valuable minerals, and that's the place that we're standing on. I am standing on top of the lithosphere. Now, the atmosphere is the stuff that I'm breathing in. It's the stuff which I fly through in an uh, airplane. Now, the atmosphere is more than just that little layer down here at the bottom which we're breathing in. That's only around about 15 kilometers thick. Now, what we're going to start doing is we're going to take a look at some of the other layers that are on top there, and we're going to see which one does what. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be concentrating on this 90 kilometers of interesting gas. We're going to find out what's inside there. Okay, so guys, if you're taking notes, please... Just some bullet forms, but we are going to be posting these up onto the page, aren't we, Indy? Mm -hmm. Okay, right, so these notes are going to be going up onto the page, so please don't panic about feverishly writing. There's a lot of information. I just want you to watch, learn, and share some stuff on the page. I can see Indy's already typing away there. Furiously. Okay, <laughs> all right, so now let's take a look at the parts of these gases, these mixtures of gases. Now, these numbers are relatively fixed anywhere around the world. I can be sure that I can breathe the air there unless it's particularly polluted. I know that there is a certain percentage of gases. Okay, so let's take a look at them. Let's see what's going on inside this pie chart of mine. Okay, now I'm going to start with the one which is my personal favorite, okay, because it keeps me alive. I like it in the morning. I like it in the evening. I like it all the time I'm alive. Okay, so that is oxygen. So oxygen is the gas which keeps me alive. Now... The reason for that is because it supports my cells, but we're going to take a look at that in, um, in a moment. So don't worry about making notes about the individual gases. We're going to take it apart. So oxygen is there. It makes up around about 21% of the atmospheric oxygen. Now, the interesting thing is that oxygen hasn't always been around. 
around about three or four billion years ago, there was almost no oxygen in the atmosphere at all. Now, what started to happen was certain organisms actually started manufacturing the oxygen. And oxygen at that time was actually poisonous to most living things. Most living things worked on ammonia and carbon dioxide and all these really heavy gases. Now, oxygen itself was actually a toxin to other organisms. We're going to pay attention to oxygen in a moment. Okay, the other major component of air is nitrogen. You guys are breathing in a whole bunch of it. Almost 80% of air that you breathe in, you breathe straight back out. You cannot use it directly. That is nitrogen. Nitrogen we're going to pay, pay attention to. The reason that there's so much of it in the air is because it doesn't readily react. It doesn't stick together in compounds very easily, and that's one of the reasons that it floats around as a gas. Okay, and then our friend argon is another one, around about 1%. You'll notice that uh, these numbers don't add up exactly all the time because there's other bits and pieces inside the atmosphere as well. So argon is another around about 1%. Now the really interesting thing is um, argon is one of those things which doesn't play any role in any sort of ecosystem. Argon, remember, is one of the noble gases. It's something which cannot actually make compounds. If it can't make compounds, life cannot be involved in it. Okay, so let's start taking a look at some of the other bits and pieces I might find inside the atmosphere. Okay, so there's a really nice picture of all the molecules which I might find inside the atmosphere, and I can already see the three which I've highlighted on our pie chart. Now, so there's our nitrogen over there. Remember that nitrogen is diatomic. Oxygen as well. So oxygen is also diatomic. So N2 and O2 make up over 99% of the air which I'm breathing in right now. Now, a mixture of these two can keep me alive very, very happily. Those are the only two which I actually need in the air. Now, you might say, why don't I breathe in pure oxygen? Well, your body is actually built to breathe in 20 to 22% oxygen. Any more than that actually starts to change the physiology inside your body. Now, there are other bits and pieces inside atmospheric um, gases. Now, I'm sure you'll notice there's argon over there. I've already spotted argon. Argon was the other 1%. Now there's a few other important bits and pieces here. Okay, CO2. Now this is something particularly interesting. CO2 is the stuff which I'm breathing out. After I've burned up all my food, after I've eaten a meal and I've taken in oxygen, I breathe out CO2. When a vehicle drives, it burns fossil fuels to give out more CO2. CO2 is a product of burning any sort of fuel or the product of cellular respiration. Now, there's a huge amount of information coming at you guys. We're going to take it slowly, piece by piece by piece. Okay, now some other bits and pieces. The ones that nobody really talks about, but I thought it was quite nice to actually have them up here on the board. Okay, this one is becoming more and more important, and Indy had to bring it up. This is the product of cow farts, and sheep, and goats, <laughs> and even humans. Okay, that has the formula of CH4. Its name is methane. Okay, it is a flammable gas, it's found inside natural gas, and uh, the problem with it is along with CO2, it actually causes a major atmospheric problem, but we're going to discuss that at a later stage. Now you'll notice some other colorful partners over here, helium, neon, krypton, and xenon. You'll notice that they're all on their own. The reason for that is because all of those guys are noble gases. I find all of these in very, 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 very small amounts in the atmosphere, as single atoms. It's one of the few gases which actually come out as, um, as single atoms. You'll notice N2, O2, they're all coming in compounds or molecules. Now, these guys cannot actually make compounds. Now, trace, trace, trace amounts of this stuff. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, so a small amount of it is trickling into the outer atmosphere at all times, and uh, it's just leftovers from the origins of the universe. It's still being stuck onto the Earth. Okay, so now I've pummeled you with a huge amount of information. Let's take it a little bit slower, and let's take a look at some of that information. Let's find out what's actually going on. Okay, so here we go. Now the atmosphere is divided up into roughly four layers. Now these layers have got very specific boundaries, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the most interesting ones, what happens in each one, and maybe you can take some notes off there. Okay, so let's start close to home, let's start right down here in the troposphere. Okay, now the troposphere down here from 0 to 15 kilometers. Now, the troposphere is where you will spend most of your life, unless you are lucky enough to exit into the outer atmosphere and actually to go up as an astronaut. Okay, 
So a troposphere, the troposphere is where all the living organisms in the world are thought to, thought to be. Okay, the troposphere, the hydrosphere, and the lithosphere, these together make the biosphere. Okay, so the troposphere is the layer of oxygen and nitrogen and argon and all that stuff, which is at its densest down here at the bottom. One of the reasons that I can actually live down here is because the air is quite thick. Now, you might say, okay, well, you know, I can just put my hands through it. But when you wave your hand through the air, you can actually feel air molecules bumping against your hand. Now, that's only really true in the troposphere. The troposphere is one of the warmer layers of air, and it supports all of the life on Earth. Now, this is a mixture of gas, which we're actually breathing in right now. That is the troposphere. It's also the layer of gas that you fly through if you're inside an aircraft. The aircraft goes to the upper layers of the troposphere. And one of the reasons that aircraft like to go at a higher altitude is because the air starts to thin out. That means that the air molecules start to get further and further and further apart from each other. That means that the aircraft has to move through less air, and it's actually easier to slip through there. There's less air resistance as I go up. Now, what you notice is that as I go out of the troposphere, something quite interesting starts to happen. Temperatures start to get very, very, very cold. There's parts over here of the upper troposphere, and um, if you actually take a look at some of the information from an aircraft flight, and some aircraft actually tell you this information, is in the upper layers of the troposphere, uh, these lines, there's actually very specific lines on where things start to change, and those are called pauses. So where the troposphere ends, I call this the tropospheric pause. So let me just write that in. So the tropospheric pause, or the tropopause. Now, it depends on which textbook you look at. So it's the tropospheric pause or the tropopause. There's two different ways of saying that. Now, each layer, when it stops, ends in a pause. So the tropopause, the stratopause, and the mesopause. Now, there is no thermopause because that is space. There's actually space on the outside of here. Okay, so let's carry on through our layers and let's figure out what's going on. Now, as I get to the tropopause, this is where most aircraft are flying on or around about or slightly even lower than that. The tropopause is where it's very, very, very cold because it's far away from the ground. Very little of the sun's energy actually gets absorbed into that layer, and it's quite cold, around about minus 50 degrees Celsius. Now, this is one of the reasons that aircraft some, sometimes land with ice on the wings is because those wings are very, very cold when they come back down through the atmosphere. Now, the stratosphere, you might say, okay, well, what's the point of dividing the atmosphere up into different layers? Well, each layer does something slightly different to the next. Okay, so we said that the troposphere is where all life um, actually occurs. Now, the stratosphere. Stratosphere is a home to a very important gas. That gas is ozone. So if I start to take a look inside the stratosphere, oxygen is constantly changing into ozone. Now, they're both oxygen. One is an allotrope of oxygen. O2 is changing into O3. Now, why is O3 so important? Because ozone actually protects us. Now, remember I said that the atmosphere is where um, atmosphere's functions are, well, to keep us at a good temperature, to give us breathable oxygen, and to protect us from the sun's rays. So the stratosphere is the one which actually does that. It generates a gas which is called ozone. Now, ozone is kind of like Earth's natural sunblock. What actually happens is it allows certain, certain rays to come through, but it does not allow high-energy UV or ultraviolet radiation through. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about ozone as the show goes on. Okay, but before we do that, let's start taking a look at these outer bits and pieces. Okay, the mesosphere. Meso means in between. Now what starts to happen in the mesosphere is the air gets very, very, very thin, incredibly cold. And finally, as we start leaving the mesosphere, in other words, through the mesopause, I get into what's called the thermosphere. Now the thermosphere, strangely enough, is very, very hot. One of the reasons for the thermosphere being so hot is because it's constantly stopping some of the sun's radiation. Now, different types of radiation get stopped out in the thermosphere, and what you actually notice is that the thermosphere itself um, actually gets up to temperatures as close as 1,000 degrees. Now, these very, very thin particles out here in the thermosphere are responsible for the stopping of things like meteorites. You might actually notice over there. Okay, so as it goes through the thermosphere into the mesosphere, 
I'll actually notice falling stars or meteorites. So I'm sure that uh, some of you have seen these, especially far away from the city lights. You can actually see these stopping in the thermosphere and the mesos mesosphere. One of the reasons that they look like stars is because these falling rocks are traveling through there at such high speeds that they actually catch a light. They, they light up the sky and they actually burn at high temperatures. Some of them are traveling at up to 50,000 kilometers per hour, so that's pretty quick. When they travel through the thin atmosphere over here, they leave behind a trail of glowing sparks. Okay, so now that we've left the atmosphere and we've gone out into space, you can actually see there it is, the space shuttle, which is no longer being used, sadly enough. Okay, now, well, that's not the, the space shuttle. That is a model of a replacement for the space shuttle, which I'm hoping will happen. Uh, the satellite, okay? And as you start leaving out into the thermosphere, you get out into space where there is no oxygen, no nitrogen, and none of those gases to breathe in. This is one of the reasons that you need protective craft and you need spacesuits to survive out there. The air is absolutely thinned out. There is almost no oxygen to breathe at all. But one of the really cool things about it is that there is no air to slow down satellites. So once you get them up there, they keep on spinning around Earth without being, without being lifted up anymore. Okay. Now, I've talked your ears off, so what I think I should do, Indy, is give them a little bit of a break. Yes. And then uh, let them absorb this, digest this, and breathe some of that atmosphere in. Exactly. Okay, guys, deep breaths. Now post your questions on the page. I see there's quite a few here, and I'll go through them with Phil now during the break. But if there is anything that Phil is going over, please post onto our page, and let's get, let's, let's get talking. I think this is a nice mm -hmm. conversational piece, and I can see that you guys love, love, love this subject and this topic, which I think is so exciting. See you now after the break. Hi guys and welcome back to Learn Extra Live. I hope that you're enjoying the session and you're learning lots as much as I am. Guys, we've got lots of questions coming through from you and some of them are brilliant questions. Phil has said, well done. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep those questions for the last 15 minutes, but keep them coming and, and they really are cool. And I just wanted to say, um, big up to Takalani, always joining in, always asking questions and I think it's so cool because this little community is for you guys. Right, Phil? Yeah, absolutely, Indy. You guys have been absolutely wonderful. I've been looking on the page. You guys are asking the most awesome questions. So uh, just hang on tight. Some of your questions, the answers are going to be coming out throughout the show. And if they're not, I'm going to be answering, that, uh, answering them directly once I learn how to speak again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so deep breath in. Take in some nitrogen. Let's start going through the pieces of the atmosphere. Okay, so now let's just make sure that we know the properties of those gases which we're going inside there. So let's start again of the gases which are part of all of the atmosphere. And somebody actually asked me, what actually holds the atmosphere onto the earth if it's a gas? Why didn't it just blow off into space? And that one of the gases which is held down is nitrogen. And one of the reasons that it's held down is because strangely enough, gases are also molecules and they are also particles which are acted on by gravity. Now, it might say, okay, well, air is so light. Why does gravity act on it? Well, that's one of the reasons that the gas is on the top. One of the reasons that there's solid underneath me is because the solid is much more dense. So the solids and liquids are on the floor, and the gases are on top. So gravity is holding everything down, but it's holding the, so the solids and the liquids down. So that's the land and the sea first, and then the air is on top. So the air is actually held down by gravity as well. And that's one of the reasons that the atmosphere is actually collected on the outside is because the gases are the lightest. Okay, so let's take a look at those gases. Let's start out with nitrogen. Remember the formula N2. We're going to get through these quite quickly because you guys actually know most of this. But nitrogen, quite important to note that it is inert. That means that it does not react very easily. Now, nitrogen in the atmosphere cannot actually react very easily, and it's actually quite a problem to get nitrogen to react. Okay. I need this specifically, and this is one of the reasons that I need nitrogen, is to make amino acids, and you're saying amino what? One of the things that amino acids builds for me is proteins. So the muscles inside my body, even the cell structures inside my body are supported by proteins. Proteins are also the enzymes which can digest things inside your stomach and inside your gut. Now, amino acids are very, very important things. Now, one of the reasons that life started on Earth is because there's so much nitrogen around. And nitrogen can make amino acids for proteins. So you guys doing life sciences, I hope you're watching. And nucleic acids. And those are DNA and RNA. Okay, so deoxyribonucleic acid and Ribonucleic acid, now you don't actually need to know these, but basically these are what encode the body building plan for myself. 
Okay, so nitrogen is very important to actually build up a plan to build one of me. So without DNA, there's no me, there's no you, and without amino acids, we couldn't live. So nitrogen is very important. Okay, I also use liquid nitrogen in industry. So here's one of the uses. I use light, uh, liquid nitrogen to cool things down. Now, if you've ever seen sort of a steamy liquid which goes over things, I can freeze objects with that liquid, and that is liquid nitrogen. That is at almost minus 200 degrees Celsius. So it actually burns your fingers. Well, it feels like it's burning your fingers, because what, is it, what it does is it freezes your cells, and it gives you instant frostbite. It actually destroys tissue. Sometimes that's actually a good thing. If you've got warts on your skin, they put liquid nitrogen on just to freeze and kill those cells. So it just kills those ones. Okay, so let's turn our attention to the next one, my favorite, oxygen. Breathe it in. I need it to teach. Okay, so oxygen, formula O2, there it is. Okay, so now when we're dealing with O2, one of the things that is quite strange is that oxygen is very reactive. And I need it to be very reactive. It must react with the chemicals inside my body to give me energy. It must react with glucose inside my body to give me the energy to live. So oxygen itself is probably one of the most important things for animals like myself to live. So it is very reactive. It supports life that way. And it's needed by all aerobic. Now that word aerobic means that I require oxygen to perform respiration. This is cellular respiration I'm talking about. Okay, so aerobic organisms, this, that means oxygens which require oxygen. They all need oxygen. Now this wasn't always the case. Now one of the things that oxygen was actually, um, one of the reasons why it's so interesting is that oxygen actually wasn't part of the atmosphere for a very, very long time. It's only after these organisms called cyanobacteria, billions of years ago, started manufacturing oxygen as a waste product. Now, this oxygen started to pollute the atmosphere. Oxygen was actually toxic to the other organisms. And what actually started to happen was there was so much oxygen new organisms started to develop, which took advantage of oxygen's reactivity. And this is where our current cell line of animal cells and bacteria started to come from. This is where aerobic organisms actually come from. They took advantage of all that excess oxygen which was going out into the atmosphere. Okay, now where do I use it in industry? Okay, now if you've ever seen somebody in hospital, okay, when they've got this tube stuck inside their nose to help them breathe, that's actually an enriched feed of oxygen. That means that their lungs are struggling to breathe and they're taking a little bit of extra oxygen. One of the questions that was asked, why can't we breathe in or what happens when we do breathe in lots of extra oxygen? Well, as a temporary thing, it actually helps your body. It takes stress off your body because you don't need to breathe as hard because air is only one-fifth oxygen. Now, if you give somebody 100% oxygen, what starts to happen is that their lungs can actually relax a little bit, their body can work a little bit better. But long term, it can actually cause a breakdown of cells and it's actually bad for you. Okay, I also use oxygen because it's reactive to burn with other gases to make welding, tor welding torches. What actually happens is oxygen can help other gases burn at much higher temperatures in, an, in order to actually melt metal with that sort of temperature. Let's turn our attention next to argon, okay, argon there in less than 1%, okay, it's highly inert. It does not react. It's almost impossible to get argon to make compounds. So it's absolutely vital that you know that argon is actually quite valuable because it's inert. Now, it's not valuable to animals. We don't find argon to take um, any sort of importance inside biology. No organism known actually processes argon because it can't react. To take place inside an organism and be important, usually something needs to react. Okay, but it's often used inside light bulbs. Now that's quite interesting. The light bulbs that are shining on me at the moment have got a piece of metal inside which gets to 3,000 degrees. The problem with metal and 3,000 degrees is that metals actually burn in oxygen. So what argon can do is argon can protect very hot metals. And what's actually happening there is inside light bulbs, argon protects the metal inside there. I can use it inside fluorescent tubing. If you run an electric current through argon, it actually produces a color of its own. And also, I can use it in welding. Now, this is for a different use, because in welding, I use it to protect metal from oxygen. So I can use it in another part in welding. I use argon to protect the hot metals when I'm welding. Now, one of the metals which can only be welded 
with argon is actually aluminium. Aluminium is a very reactive metal. If you try and melt aluminium in the presence of oxygen, it actually catches on fire. So what welders do is they put a blanket of argon on. They spray argon over the surface of the aluminium so that it won't burn. Okay, and we're almost there. Now, one of the most important ones. Now, pay attention. You're busy breathing this stuff out right now. Okay, carbon dioxide. Hugely important stuff. Okay, it is quite inert. One of the reasons that I know that it's inert is because carbon dioxide can put out a fire. It stops a fire from happening. Some fire extinguishers actually give out a whole bunch of carbon dioxide, and that actually starves the oxygen from the fire, so the fire goes out. Now, it's needed by all plants, so it's not completely inert. So it's needed by all plants to perform photosynthesis. So that's pretty important. And this is one of the reasons that oxygen actually first started in the atmosphere, is because of photosynthesis. It's released as a byproduct of cellular respiration. Now, this is where it comes around. Now, this is where you come in. Carbon dioxide actually gets made inside your body through cellular respiration. I eat food for glucose, I breathe in oxygen, the two combine and give me carbon dioxide as a product. Now, here's the downside of carbon dioxide. Now, it traps heat in the atmosphere. Now, that should start sounding for a little bit familiar. We're actually going to take a look at a really cool animation. So, I think Indy's starting to post the post that link? I've got it. I shall okay. post it. Okay. All right. So there is a link to an amazing animation about this trapping of heat inside the atmosphere, and I'm going to do this with you in a short while. Okay. Now, that's a good and a bad thing. Right. Now, on to industrial uses for carbon dioxide, dry ice. I'm sure that you've seen it before. The guys that sell ice creams or cold drinks at a soccer match or at a rugby match or a cricket match, those guys have got small white blocks of dry ice. That is solid carbon dioxide. Solid carbon dioxide is really, really cool to keep food, well, excuse the pun, okay? It's really awesome to keep food very, very cold because those blocks, when they melt, they're actually sublime. They don't actually melt through a liquid form. Carbon dioxide doesn't exist as a liquid at most pressures. So what you'll find is that carbon dioxide changes straight from a solid into a gas, and that's why it's called dry ice. Now, dry ice also is very, very cold, minus 78 degrees. So it's very good at keeping things frozen, like ice cream, at a very hot day. So what you'll notice is that dry ice is very, very useful stuff when I want to actually keep things cold. Okay, now, what does the atmosphere do? Now, <coughs> apart from keeping me alive, there's a couple of other functions which people don't actually realize, is that it keeps a stable temperature. Now, a lot of people are saying, okay, well, why do we actually need an atmosphere? Why don't I just carry around my own little pocket of oxygen? And you can do that for a little while in, a, in the form of a spacesuit. But one of the things that I take for granted is that there is a relatively stable temperature. Um, some parts are less stable than others, but overall on Earth, there's a stable enough temperature that life exists all over Earth. And this is one of the things that I'm particularly keen on. Okay, now liquid water is a pretty big deal. Now, we're one of the few planets in the solar system where you find liquid water, and there's actually a lot of liquid water. 71% of our Earth's surface is covered in liquid water. We have so much. Now, the only reason that it's liquid is because it's above zero degrees and it's below 100. Now, that stable temperature is actually needed for that liquid water to exist like that. There's lots of water out in the solar system. In fact, water is the most common compound in the universe. The problem is water is usually in the form of ice. Now, there are planets out there. There's um, one of the moons out there in the solar system called Europa, which has got a solid covering of ice. They think there might actually be liquid water underneath there supporting life. But liquid water is a pretty big deal when you're trying to support life. Okay? And this is quite important. It protects us from harmful radiation. Now, I'm just going to elaborate because harmful radiation is a little bit too general. So what I'm actually going to say is that the harmful radiation which comes in from the cosmos, from the sun falls roughly into these two categories. Ultraviolet, which is UV, and X-rays. The sun is one giant big nuclear reactor, and it's constantly throwing UV rays and X-rays at us. So what starts to happen is it starts to pelt down on the planet. And one of the things that the atmosphere must do, and one of its functions, is actually to protect me from these harmful types of radiation. Okay, well. Now that we're speaking about the sun, what I want to do is I want to focus a little bit on how 
it actually protects us from the radiation. Now, please, we're going to start talking about one particular um, aspect of the atmosphere protecting us. Okay, and then we're going to take a look at another. The first one is we're going to start taking a look at the one which is to do with ozone. Okay, now the ozone layer is the one that protects us from radiation. Okay, now here's the big deal. UV or ultraviolet radiation, this is the stuff that gives you cancer, it ages your skin, um, it can cause mutations, right? So what UV radiation does is it comes in and destroys the DNA inside your cells and sometimes your body can't repair it properly and that's bad. UV radiation is absorbed by ozone. Okay, this is the magic thing. Things seem to have lined up perfectly for the formation of animals on Earth. Without ozone and without oxygen, we couldn't be alive. And ozone, this magic little molecule, has got some amazing properties. It acts like a natural sunscreen over the Earth. Okay, well, it's made naturally. One of the weird things is that UV light makes it, and UV light is absorbed by it. So this is quite important. You can activate oxygen with UV and make it into ozone. And this happens inside the stratosphere. This is where most of the ozone actually happens. Ozone itself is actually very, very toxic to humans. Ground level ozone is actually called a pollutant. It actually damages skin cells because ozone itself is quite toxic. But when it's up there in the stratosphere protecting me from up above, it's amazing. It's like a natural sunscreen around the earth. So this ozone layer that they start talking about is actually found in part of the stratosphere. Okay, now here's the big problem. Along came humans, and uh, humans have done something very bad. They've made chemicals, which they didn't know would be bad. They are called CFCs. Okay, now it's quite a mouthful to say this all out, but if you do, you sound really, really smart. Okay, so let me show you where the C, the F, and the C come from. Okay, so C for chloro, F for fluoro, and then C again for carbon. So chloro, fluoro, carbons. Okay, so let me just do that again. It doesn't look that neat. Uh, so if you taking some notes at home. There we go. So just remember that fluoro is spelled with F-L-U because otherwise it's flowero. Okay, so chloro, fluoro, carbon. So there we go, CFCs. These are chemicals which float up naturally through the atmosphere because they're gases themselves. When they get up there, they actually mess things up. They destroy the ozone particles. And that takes away our natural sunscreen, and of course people get exposed to UV radiation, x-rays, and they actually get skin cancer. Now, sadly for us, the damage to the ozone layer is heaviest around the southern hemisphere. So what you'll find is that in Argentina, South Africa, and Australia, we actually have much higher levels of skin cancer as a result of that depleted ozone layer. Now, you can be smart about this, protect yourself using normal sunscreen or clothing, or you can uh, sunbathe at correct times of year. Oddly enough, the sun is at its worst and the UV radiation is actually at its worst from October to December in South Africa. The ozone layer actually naturally fixes itself and gets thicker towards March. Sadly, that's getting colder. Okay, so our holiday months, December is actually one of the worst months to be out in the sun. One of the reasons for that is because the UV gets through. The ozone is at its thinnest. There is less and less of it. Okay, I think I'm going to rush in something before we take another ad break. I want to talk to you a little bit about the heating of the atmosphere. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about the natural heating of the atmosphere, which is good, and the unnatural heating of the atmosphere, which is a really bad thing. So let's run through the steps. Okay, now the heating of the atmosphere naturally is still called the greenhouse effect. Now, a lot of you are saying, okay, no, the greenhouse effect is bad, it's causing global warming. No, 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 no. The greenhouse effect is one of those things that keeps the temperature up high enough that I can get liquid water and actually support life on Earth. So the greenhouse effect actually is a good thing. However, too much of a good thing, that's where the problem comes in. So let's run through the steps. Okay, so the greenhouse effect, there's five major steps inside here. Now, these keywords I'm going to highlight. Infrared, or heat, is coming in from the sun, and that's a great thing. That's what I feel when I stand inside the sun, and the sun warms me up so beautifully, I'm feeling infrared rays landing on my skin. Okay? Now, infrared rays are not the same as UV rays. Infrared rays just make me warm. Okay? So they come through the atmosphere, the atmosphere doesn't take them in, and then they land on the ground. So this is where most of the heating happens. And this answers one of the questions that was actually posted on the page. 
is why, it, why, are the, uh, why is the temperature down at the ground the hottest? Well, the infrared actually doesn't interact with the air. It warms up the surface of the ground, and that's where the heat starts to make its way through the atmosphere. So it starts at the ground, and the ground will be warmest. Okay, so the ground heats up the atmosphere on the surface by conduction. So it actually touches the, the closest air and allows that to warm up just purely by touching it. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Now, this is starting to get into the realms where I'm going to need diagrams much better than I can actually draw. I'm going to try to draw one, but the animation is going to be the one. Okay, some of the heat is re-radiated back into space as infrared. So any hot object gives off infrared or heat rays. Now, here's where the atmosphere comes in. Okay, water, carbon dioxide are all naturally, thing, naturally occurring things, and methane. These are the major greenhouse gases. These gases can catch the infrared rays. There we go. So they trap them. So they catch the infrared rays, and this, this is the greenhouse effect. Okay, and then they trap the heat itself, and this is called the greenhouse effect. Okay. And uh, what I'll actually find is that natural greenhouse effect actually keeps it warm enough for us to live. I need the greenhouse effect. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly run you through a diagram. We're going to come back after a break, and I'm going to show you a huge, awesome animation about the greenhouse effect. I just wanted to show you this really simplistic diagram of what's actually going on over there. Now, one of the reasons it's called a greenhouse is because the atmosphere actually acts like a layer of glass. Inside a greenhouse, the sun's rays come through and warm up the inside but don't allow the heat to get out. So once again, what I'm finding is that the sun allows the infrared or heat rays to strike the surface of the earth. And what actually happens after there is that the infrared is trapped on the surface. So the heat, in other words, is trapped on the surface by these greenhouse gases. That is called the greenhouse effect. Now I want you guys to get on the page, get on that animation. We're going to take a short ad break and then come back and show you some amazing things. What do you think, Indy? That's exactly what I'm going to do. That's why I'm going to take you guys to break quick so you can get back here even faster. See you now. Hi guys and welcome back. We are entering the last 14 minutes of the show. We can't believe it. So what Phil's going to do is that he's going to just finish off his lesson and then we'll be answering questions. So if you do have any questions, now is the time to post it on our page. Um, big up to Liberty for making this show possible. You guys rock as usual, as always. Um, and don't forget our, fa our Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Also chat to us on Twitter at learn extra. And before I waste any more time, Phil, take it away. Thank you so much, Indy. Okay, well, just before we went through to the ad break, we were talking about the greenhouse effect. Now, please, 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 and I'm begging you, please separate these two atmospheric problems or these two atmospheric things. Ozone is to do with UV. Greenhouse effect is to do with infrared. They're two completely different things. This is to do with the trapping of heat on the, on the, uh, on the atmosphere, or in the atmosphere, rather. Please, please don't get the hole in the ozone layer mixed up with global warming. They are both problems, but they are very separate problems. Oddly enough, I'm actually going to go back through the ozone problem in a minute, but this is talking about heat on the Earth's surface, and just a little bit too much heat. This has got nothing to do with the ozone layer. Okay, so infrared, as I said, comes down. It strikes the surface of the Earth, warming it up, but then the infrared is trapped by those greenhouse gases. So let's take a look at this animation. So what I'm going to put up on the screen, and I hope that my producer is going to show you this. Okay, this is the most amazing thing. What I can actually start to see is that I have actually got these photons, these particles of light which are falling from space. So what actually happens is the very light ones are coming down to the Earth and warming up the surface of the Earth. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to switch back and we can actually start to get an av average temperature over there. Now the average temperature of the Earth is around about 12, 13 degrees, so you can actually start to see the little particles of light which are coming from outer space. Now those are your infrared particles which are coming from space. Now what starts to happen is that the Earth, as it warms up, starts to shine out these infrared rays. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the greenhouse effect is. I'm sure you'll notice that some of these red particles don't actually make it out into space. What you'll actually see is that some of them change direction and come back down to Earth. 
what I'm seeing over there is the greenhouse effect. There are greenhouse gases inside this, which I can't see, but bounce the heat back down to earth. Now those particles, those greenhouse gases are water, carbon dioxide, methane. There's some nitrogen oxides as well. And what we can actually do is in this program, we can change what actually goes on here. So what we can do is we can increase the amount of greenhouse gases inside there. So what I'm going to do at the moment is I'm going to go on the right hand side here, going from none to lots. I'm going to increase the amount of greenhouse gases. Now while I do that, I want you to take a look at the thermometer on the left hand side of the screen and watch what slowly starts to happen. So even if I increase the amount of greenhouse gases, whoop, I'm drawing on the screen. There we go. If I increase the greenhouse gases even slightly, what you'll start to notice with time is that the temperature slowly starts to climb. Now, it was 14 degrees, and what you'll notice is that it's now 16, 17 degrees. If we go even further with these greenhouse gases, I'll notice that the temperature goes up even further. It does take a little while to build up, but now we're hovering 15, 16, 17, and it changes. But I noticed that when f we started in the show, we had 12, 13, 14. Now we're up to 17 degrees. Now you might say, what difference does 3 degrees make? Okay, well, three degrees might, in certain parts of the world, change the temperature from zero, where ice is, um, ice is solid water. Now, if I change from zero to three degrees, all of that ice is going to change into liquid water. Now, you might say, well, so what? If that ice changes into water, that's okay. There's more water for me to swim in. The problem is that a huge amount of water is present on land in the form of glaciers, and in the form of icebergs, and what you'll notice is that if those all melt, what starts to happen is that that water combines with the sea volume actually rising sea levels. Now, there's been recent predictions that if all of that ice melts, especially over Greenland and, and Art Antarctica, the ice um, could actually result in a 10 meter raising of the sea levels. And you might say, okay, well, 10 meters is not that much, but if 10 meters was the level of the sea, what you'll notice, oh, sorry, 10 meters was the increase in the level of the sea. What you'd notice is that a great deal of coastal towns would actually vanish. A huge amount of islands would go away. The habitats along the beach, beach fronts would disappear. So it's quite a big deal to actually change the temperature by three or four degrees. And you actually notice we've started peaking here at 90 degrees. Now, the difference of five or six degrees they've actually noticed would actually cause absolute devastation to the ecology. So global warming is a major, major issue, and there's a lot of problems to solve it. Now, I'm going to show you why it's happening and how we can potentially solve it. Okay, so let's get into man's effect on this whole deal. Okay, now here's the two major sources of greenhouse gases. Now, what you'll notice is that the burning of fossil fuels, this is a major, major contributor. Now, fossil fuels are like petrol, diesel, paraffin, coal, which produces all our electricity. Fossil fuels produce a huge amount of CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. Okay, So that causes a huge amount of greenhouse gases, in fact, too much. And this phenomenon is called global warming. Please, don't get all your terms mixed up. The greenhouse effect is what is resulting in global warming. Sometimes they just loosely refer to it as a climate change. So that is another term which is sometimes associated. Now, climate change. Now, for anyone wondering if the climate really is changing, I don't know if anyone noticed that winter in Johannesburg came very, very late in the year, unseasonably late, and America has recorded their hottest year to date on average. So it is happening. It is real. Uh, if there's any debate about it, unfortunately, the time for debating is over. We need to change something. Okay. Now, here's another contributor, strangely enough, and... Indy brought this up a little bit earlier on. Farming of livestock, okay, the cow farts, okay. I'm very worried about these cow farts, Phil. Okay. I'm very worried about the oddly situation. Enough, oddly yeah. enough, they believe that um, the farts of animals and livestock actually contribute 10% of global warming. Okay, so the farming of livestock for, for the meat industry, okay, is a huge producer of methane or CH4, which is a gas which is actually much more powerful as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So here's your major causes is these uh, fossil fuels, okay, when I burn the fossil fuels, okay, they give off lots and lots of CO2, so anytime you use electricity from a coal-fired um, electricity plant, which in South Africa that's almost always, okay, or you're actually eating a meat product or driving anything which is, uh, which is produced, anything has got what's known as a carbon footprint, 
A carbon footprint is a loose reference to the amount of carbon chemicals which are going out into the air. So when I talk about a carbon footprint, you're talking about the amount of CO2 and the amount of methane, the amount of CH4, which are being emitted out into the atmosphere and causing that greenhouse effect. So everything has got a carbon footprint. My being here, driving here in a car has got a carbon footprint using electricity. Now, the idea is to minimize your carbon footprint. Recycling, uh, walking as much as possible, using a bicycle instead of a car, there's lots of ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint. One of the major ones is actually using less electricity. So switch off all the lights, just keep your TV on us. We've got some time for questions. Wow, and so many questions we have. Shall we start from the very beginning? Absolutely. Okay, let's have a look here. So let's start right from the beginning. Um, let's see. So Takalani says, so what causes the temperature to decrease with an increase in height in the tropospher troposphere? I can't okay. talk today either. Ah, okay. All right. So let's just bring up. Now, what I've actually drawn here is a really, really silly diagram of the troposphere, but I'm hoping that people actually understand. So what actually starts starts to happen is when this heat comes in, it doesn't actually get caught by the atmosphere on its way down. But when the heat strikes the Earth, that's where most of the heat is actually produced on the Earth's surface. So what you'll find is that the further and further I get away from the Earth's surface, I notice that the troposphere actually starts to get what's called a thermocline, meaning a change in temperature as I go up. So what actually starts to happen is on the surface of the Earth, that's where it's hottest, and the further and further I go away from it, the heat is getting less and less and less. I hope that answers that question. I hope so too. Mm. Okay, now, now since we're on the troposphere, let's go through. The, um, Zuya Buya asks, um, what height does the troposphere extend from the ground to the poles? Okay, um, let me try and see if I can answer that question. It's a bit of okay. a... Now, the troposphere is a single layer which goes all the way around the Earth. And I'm not sure what the reference to the poles is, but the troposphere is the same thickness almost all the way around the Earth. In some parts, it does get a little bit fatter, and that's around the equator. But in general, the troposphere extends around about 15 kilometers off the Earth's surface. Okay, I see, I see. Okay, let me have a look here. Um, let's have a look. Okay, what? Mahorsi wants to know, what is the difference between UV and infrared? Oh, good question. Okay, now... I need to be able to separate these two. They're both types of infrared and, um, sorry, both types of radiation which come from the sun, but they serve very different purposes. So UV, which stands for ultraviolet, that's a really awesome question, by the way. Okay, so Well done, Mahorsi. Okay. Uh, so ultraviolet radiation and IR or infrared. Okay, now infrared is something I really don't mind coming down to earth because infrared is actually heat. This is what I feel when I go out into the sun and it feels nice and warm on my skin. Infrared is, um, is heat energy. However, UV, ultraviolet, this is the bad stuff. UV actually has the ability to break down paint, it breaks down your skin, causes cancers. Okay, this can cause a whole bunch of chemical reactions inside your body. So it causes cancers, it causes aging. And this is a very harmful type of radiation. Now, let me just group them by the environmental problem that they're grouped with. Okay, so a lot of people are a little bit confused as to, okay, well, UV's for this, infrared's for this. Okay, now, until you get to matric, you're not really going to know the difference. But ultraviolet is the one that interacts with ozone. Okay, so UV is the one to talk about when you're talking about ozone. Okay? Now, just remember that the formula for ozone is O3. When you start, start to talk about infrared, the gases that you're meant to be talking about are carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the one that interacts with infrared. So carbon dioxide, okay, and that is CO2. Um, also, if you want to, you can talk about methane, which is CH3. But ozone is the one that interacts or, or clashes with UV. Carbon dioxide is the one that traps infrared. So global warming, ozone problem. Okay, so please do try separate the two because people just get so jumbled up between these two. I actually want you to go do a little bit of research. Okay. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to like pick and choose. I'm hoping that I'm picking the best ones for. They seem to be excellent. Okay, um, this one is the, mesos the mesosphere um, is closer to the sun than the troposphere, but yet is colder than the troposphere. Why? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, that's actually linked up with our diagram here. Okay. Now, the... 
Okay, the mesosphere is actually very, very high up. The troposphere as well, because it's close to the Earth, what you'll notice is that the troposphere is actually the warmest of the bunch. Now, even though it's closer to the sun, it doesn't actually get any heat because infrared goes directly through air particles. Now, that's the one thing, is that infrared goes directly through. Now, I want you to do a little bit of an experiment. If you have got a sheet of glass, you can feel the heat of the sun behind it. Now, that sheet of glass is not getting warm, and that sheet of glass is actually acting like the air in the atmosphere. The heat goes directly through it and gets hot on your hand. Now, that's actually what's happening. So, by your hand would be the troposphere, the mesosphere would be the glass. It just goes straight through the mesosphere. The mesosphere is much further away from the Earth, so it doesn't get as much of that heat energy back. Okay, Phil, my producer, our Aww. producer has said that we have come to the end of the show, unfortunately. That is sad. I know. I'm sorry. Okay, so this is my closing thing. Do you want to wave quickly to the mindsetters? Absolutely. Bye, mindsetters. <laughs> okay, let me end it off. And I think I'm going to end it off on quite a nice note. Takalani says, um, did you know that on average, one tree removes one ton of CO2 per year and provides enough oxygen for a family of four per day? So let's start a foresting. So what I Absolutely. think he's trying to say. Plant some trees. Exactly. And guys just in case you didn't know it is arbor month too so maybe what you should go and do is plant yourself some trees i like that idea thank you so much grady levens hope you enjoyed the show see you same time same place next week bye